found your way to the Texas Real Estate and Finance Podcast, and I am Mike Mills, a North Texas mortgage banker with Geneva Financial. And this is your real estate market update for the week of July the 9th. I hope everyone had a fantastic 4th of July celebrating America. And if you were able to throw it in reverse, Terry, you got all your fingers and toes and you made it back to the work week, ready to hot tua on your business and get that thing in full gear ready for the summer. I probably spent too much time on the internet this week looking at reels and relaxing on the lake. But now it's time to get you guys up to date with what's happening in and around the world of real estate as we head into the home stretch of the summer buying season. So thank you for tuning in and joining me in our quest to uh, uh, defeat Medicare. Pause. Sorry. I'm full of jokes today. Saw that debate. It's crazy, but here's the world we're in. But I'm just fired up to be back in business, so let's get this show on the road. But speaking of business, please don't forget, when I'm not making you groan with my stupid dad jokes, I'm helping your clients get pre-approved to find the home of their dreams. Today's market can be really challenging to navigate, and you need someone on your team to help your buyers understand why buying real estate is still one of the best investments that you can make. So let me be your ally in helping those hesitant buyers and sellers understand why yesterday was still the best time to buy a home, but the second best time to buy is right now. My team and I take an educational approach to help your clients understand what buying in this market is like and how it can still be the best way to build wealth for the future. We're here to be your biggest supporter in this market that is changing on us every day. So send us those referrals so we can help you get eight more after that. Give us a call. You'll be glad you did. Oh, and if you find today's episode helps you expand your already expert knowledge base, even just a little, then do this Texas native a solid and share it with a friend. Your support helps us grow our reach across this great state and find more and more hardworking real estate professionals just like you. So like our show, drop us a comment, or if you want a t-shirt, leave us a review. I'm starting to put some swag together and I'd love to send you a first edition Texas real estate and finance podcast t-shirt. If you love soft daily wear shirts, drop us a review and I'll send one out to you right away. Now what's on the docket for today's fun filled episode. Mortgage rates lead us off as always. 7% is holding fast, but we might get a six in front of that rate very soon. I'll tell you why the market's crashing. Inventory is skyrocketing or at least that's what some news sources would lead you to believe. I'll show you why that has some truth to it, but not what the headlines say. Of course, we have some quick hits from around the real estate landscape. The real estate portal wars are heating up and we'll spill the tea on the latest lawsuit in this never ending drama. I'll share some new numbers on how affordable housing is becoming more and more like Sasquatch. You heard it once existed, but don't see any evidence of it hardly anymore. And I'll share with you just another reason why there's probably not a lot of relief in sight when it comes to your home insurance premiums. And for our main topic today, I'm going to tell you about a loan program that's available to millions of Americans right now has rates under 4%, but is often misunderstood. Sound too good to be true? Well, I'll give you the details at the end. Now, first up, as always, is the question that I hear every day of my life. Hey, Mike, what are the rates? Well, although we've had lots of recent data showing the weakening economy, and when the economy weakens, we typically start to see rates improve. And they have, but not as much as we would expect. That 7% mark is being as stubborn as the Women's Olympic Basketball Selection Committee. They all know that they need to add Caitlin Clark to that team. Now, according to Mortgage News Daily, as of July 9th, the average interest rate for a conventional 30-year loan is about 7.01%. The average 30-year FHA rate is about 6.48%. The average 30-year VA rate is 6.5%. The average 15-year conventional rate is about 6.41% and the average 30-year jumbo rate is about 7.22%. On Thursday this week, we'll get the CPI report for June. And right now, the expectation is that CPI will go from 3.3% to 3.2%, further easing the rate of inflation. And this would be a great thing for mortgage rates because with unemployment ticking up last week to 4.1%, and CPI possibly falling this week, that could spell another big move for the bond market, which could lead to rates finally getting and staying below 7%. So hold on to your hats because lower mortgage rates could be on the horizon. And if rates do start trending lower, the mortgage application rates could also see a bump. Because believe it or not, we've already started to see a small bump in refinances compared to this time last year. 
So last year on July 6th, the average mortgage rate was 6.81%. But even with higher rates, this year we've seen a 9% increase in refinances. Now, it's believed that many of these refinances are cash out loans that people are either taking out in order to pay off debt that's been accumulating over the last few years or to improve homes that they aren't planning on moving out of. You see, there are many homeowners out there that are wanting to move to upgrade their housing situation, but because of much higher home prices are unable to get that upgrade unless they spend a significant amount more at a significantly higher rate so instead they're electing to add that pool or redo that kitchen or bathroom and stay where they are yeah the rates higher but rates fluctuate up and down and they'll most likely have an opportunity to refinance again if they need to but right now they're still able to get the extra amenities that they want without having to move you see, people who've been paying attention are starting to realize that rates aren't making any big moves anytime soon. And even if the Fed does decide to start cutting rates this year, which is likely, it isn't going to move the needle that much. And this climb down to lower rates is going to take years unless there's a significant economic downturn. And that is still a possibility. But without that, we're going to be in this 6% to 7% range for quite a while. And home prices are going to continue to climb, maybe at a slower rate but not falling off dramatically anytime soon. So if you got clients on the fence, encourage them to make decisions on their situation and not the market. Because right now, there's just too many unknowns. There could be some price declines, but not significant ones. And oh, by the way, if there were significant moves, it would more likely be in the direction of higher prices. Because as my broken record has been saying for quite a while now, we still don't have enough inventory to get any dramatic price drops anytime soon. So encourage your clients to buy the house for the neighborhood and the situation, not because they think rates or prices are going to go up or down. Because five years after they buy their home, the price and the rate won't really matter that much. But where they live and the house that they come home to each day, Will. Okay, now, what is the market actually doing and where are we trending these days? Well, right now we're halfway through 2024 and the good news for housing at least is we are recovering from historic inventory lows. Inventory is improving and that's why we're starting to see in some markets home prices slow their growth. You see, in March of 2022, we only had 240,000 active single family homes available for sale across the country. But currently we have 652,000 single family homes available for purchase. However, that isn't close to the market average for inventory. It's way better than it was in 2022 though, when we saw values appreciating at 25 to 30% a year. But there are some trends showing a slowing of this growth. For example, we added only 6,800 new listings to the market just this week. Whereas last week we added almost 11,000 new listings. But last year at this time, inventory shrunk by 500 listings to 466,000. So again, better overall listings this year, but showing some signs of slowing down. And remember in 2015, at this same time, we had over 1.1 million homes available for sale. And today we're at half that number. Again, improving, but we're still not where we need to be to bring prices down of any significance. This is also the typical seasonal peak for new listings because August is when we start to see listings declining and fewer homes coming available for sale until we start peaking again in May of next year. Now the higher inventory has been a welcome site for home buyers but it will start to decline as we get deeper into 2024. So are we seeing more price cuts with this higher inventory? Well, yes and no. Price cut percentages are higher this year than they have been for the last two years. Right now we're at 38% price cuts as compared to 33% in 2023 and 32% in 2022. But it's still not too much above the market average, which is over a third of all homes in any given year are typically taking price cuts. So same thing better, but not substantial. Now with more inventory, we have also seen an improvement in demand, meaning more people who are selling are also buying, but the growth has been minimal. We have trended above 2023 so far in pending contracts, but just barely. And we're starting to wind down that improvement as we head into the fall. So far, we've seen just about 3% growth in pending contracts, but it is starting to level off. You see, this week was basically flat in pending contracts compared to last year at the same time. So that's the national numbers. But what about here in North Texas? Well, for the second week in a row, the median home price was down about 2% to $400,679. But remember, median is a mix of sales, so not necessarily prices. It could be that lower priced homes are selling at a greater rate than higher priced homes. But either way, it's still coming down. New listings were also down. Now, it is hard to get exact data in real time from week to week, but overall for the month, we're down about 10% compared to this time last year. Now, the average days on market has jumped, to about 24 days on average, which is up 32% compared to this time last year. And the months of supply is up to three and a half months, which is a 60% jump 
from this time last year. Now, while that is significant, it's all perspective. We were at a terribly unhealthy inventory level even just last year. And now we're just in a somewhat unhealthy level. Remember, six to seven months of inventory is required for a healthy, balanced housing market. And we're still a good ways away from that. We still have about 17% of homes that are selling above list price and about 37% of homes that are taking price cuts, which isn't really too far off the average over the last 10 years. So the basic theme of everything that I just talked about here is we are seeing improvement to home prices and inventory, but not substantial and not enough to claw us back to a level of affordability that allows the average person to be able to purchase a home today. It's still very expensive. And even though it's improving, it's still not enough to put a dent in this incredibly unaffordable market. And if rates do change at any significant level in the positive direction, meaning they come down a little bit, then these numbers are all going to flip back to much higher prices and much lower inventory just like that. Okay, so what are some of the big stories that you need to know about that you might have missed while you were out there selling this week? Well, it's getting really nasty in the world of online real estate portals. So Realtor.com's parent company, Move Inc., is suing CoStar, owner of Homes.com, for stealing its trade secrets. So this lawsuit alleges that James Kaminsky, who left Realtor.com for CoStar, quote, secretly exfiltrated Moves trade secrets and spied on Moves real-time confidential electronic documents to give CoStar a massive unfair competitive advantage. Now, this theft is part of the reason the lawsuit claims for Homes.com's rapid growth. Now, the documents that Move claims that Kaminsky accessed include information about content planned for Realtor.com, ideas for future stories, metrics showing user traffic, a list of contacts, lists of Realtor.com's employees and their compensation and other private business information. Andy Florence, the CEO of the CoStar Group, called the trade secret lawsuit a PR stunt motivated by the listing platform's recent struggles, which, by CoStar's metrics, have caused the firm to fall behind Zillow and Homes.com and the so-called portal wars. The numbers are clear. The numbers are verified. We have 156 million unique monthly visits for our homes network, and they have 72 million. So we're about 84 million ahead of them in monthly visitors, and that is a nine alarm fire for them. This is a big problem, Florence said in his statement. So Zillow, Realtor.com, and Homes.com are all trying to figure out who's going to be the national MLS. And now they're using the courts to hash it out. Who you got your money on? All right, next up, according to Reventure Consulting, the median new mortgage payment requires about 41.5%. 4% of the median U.S. household income. To put this in perspective, even at the peak of the 2008 financial crisis, this particular metric topped out at 39.3%. So on a post-tax basis, new home buyers are spending over half of their annual income on mortgage payments. Even renting a home now costs 30% of the median household income in the U.S. So renting isn't that much better either. And the last time housing affordability was this bad, interest rates were nearly 20%. So right now, simply having a place to live is becoming very much a luxury. And if home buyers are spending half of their income on their mortgage, what about everything else? Because right now, the median car payment is nearly $800 a month and food affordability is at record lows. Now, my question is, why isn't this at the top of every politician running for office's platform right now? Whether it be president, House of Representatives, or Senate, any person running against an incumbent should have this as their number one talking point, yet you barely hear it mentioned. The reason, at least in my opinion, is that this isn't a red versus blue issue. This is a haves versus have nots issue. And the haves don't care about the have nots, and in fact, prefer that there are more of the have-nots. Your dollar is losing more and more value every single day, and as they keep telling us, you will own nothing and you will be happy. So my question to you is, are you happy? 2024 is shaping up to be a year we may not soon forget. I just hope that we can figure all of this out before everything boils over. Because right now, there's lots of pissed off people out there, and it doesn't seem like those in charge seem to really give a damn about that. Speaking of being pissed off, Insurance in Texas is up almost 60% in the last five years, and this year might cause it to go up even more. So the 2024 hurricane season is off to an unusually early start. Hurricane Barrel, which right now is causing havoc on the Texas coastline. I hope all of our friends down there are staying safe at this crazy time right now. But it's the first Category 4 hurricane to form in the month of June. Now, once it hit the coastline, it was only a Category 1. 
but the category four had formed out in the Gulf. And this turned into a category four around June to the 28th. Now the previous record was Hurricane Dennis, which became a category four hurricane on July 8th of 2005. And if you remember, 2005 was the same year that Hurricane Katrina struck the Gulf Coast, becoming the strongest hurricane ever recorded in the Gulf Coast and was one of the most intense hurricanes on record at that time, only to be surpassed by Hurricane Rita and Wilma that also happened that exact same year. 2005 was one of the most active and destructive hurricane seasons in modern history. 2005 was also the hottest year on record for ocean temperatures in the Atlantic, only to be surpassed by, guess what, this year. 2024 and by a pretty substantial margin. Now, I'm not going to go through all the stats on the temperatures. You can look that up for yourself. And I'm also not going to explain that La Nina, which is also developing, is a cooling of the Pacific that reduces these storm busting Atlantic wind shears that typically keep those hurricanes in check. But if you live on the Atlantic coast or anywhere near the Gulf of Mexico, you're hoping that your already historically high insurance rates are going to start to decline or really just that you want to keep your property and your family safe. But this year is shaping up to be a hurricane season that we've never seen before. Now, weather changes and forecasts adjust, but we're already off to a really bad start. And the Texas coastline and the cities in its path are feeling the pain right now. And right now, at least, the expectation is that it's only going to get worse. Now, I'm not trying to fear monger here, but I'm just saying that everyone needs to pay attention to this. And if you live in an area that could be affected, you need especially to be paying attention. I hope and pray that this does not bear out the way that they're predicting. But if the ocean temperatures and early intensity of these first hurricanes of the season are any indication of what's to come, then we all better hold on tight for what could be an unprecedented weather year like we've never seen. All right, sorry to be a bummer there, guys, but I just got to bring you this information so everybody's aware. Now, for our main topic today, let's talk about a home loan that's available to millions of Americans, has rates available under 4%, but is very, very misunderstood. Yes, I'm talking about the mysterious assumable loan. So with rates around 7% these days, I can't tell you how often I get asked about assumable loans. They want to know how they work and how you can get a borrower to qualify for them. And you would think with millions of people having FHA and VA loans under 4% on their current home, that this often misunderstood product would be way more widely used. Well, today I'm going to demystify these widely advertised but often unused loans. I'm going to tell you how they work, how you can advertise them for your listing, what a borrower must do to qualify, and more importantly, why they aren't used as often as one would think that they should be. All right, let's start with what is an assumable loan? So first off, the only loans that are available to be assumed are FHA and VA loans. So if your seller has a conventional loan on a property that they're trying to sell, this is not going to be an option. It can only be used by someone currently carrying an FHA or a VA loan. Second, these loans can only be originated and approved by the bank that currently holds and services that loan. So if your buyer wants to use your preferred lender to do their mortgage, but Chase Bank has the FHA or VA loan for the seller currently, in that case, only Chase can originate and approve that assumable loan. So the idea on this assumable loan is that the seller offers this VA or FHA loan to the buyer at, the, at their current low rate and payment. So if the seller has a VA loan and their rate, say, is 2.5%, the buyer could have the option to take over that loan with the rate, payment, and term of the seller's current loan upon approval by the servicing bank. So the buyer could take over the loan at the same terms that the seller had when they originally got their loan. Now, technically, anyone who meets the requirements for an FHA or VA loan can take over and assume these loans. And even if you aren't an eligible veteran, you can take over a VA loan and assume the terms. Again, upon the servicing bank's approval. Sounds amazing, right? So if this option of taking over a 2% loan with a low payment and typical qualifying terms is out there and available, and frankly has been for decades, why in the hell don't more people take advantage of this and do it all the time? Well, here's where I burst bubbles. Sorry, but I don't sell sunshine and roses. I give you reality so you can know exactly what you can and cannot do because that's the only way that you're going to be best equipped to help your buyers and sellers navigate this process. All right, let's start with problem number one. This is often the biggest hurdle that most people deal with. All right, so let's say that the home you're selling is priced at $400,000 and your seller currently owes $200,000 
on their current FHA loan. In order for your seller to allow the buyer to assume that $200,000 loan, but still get the $400,000 purchase price they're looking for, the buyer is going to have to come up with an additional $200,000 to make up the difference between the loan and the sales price. And in almost all cases, this is going to have to be done with cash. And that is a major hurdle for most buyers, especially these days. Now, if you just Google this and look up if you can obtain a second loan to make up this difference, the internet's going to often tell you that you can. However, the reality is that you have two issues with secondary financing. Number one, there are very few, if any, banks that will offer any type of secondary financing on a home that you're trying to buy. Trust me, I look. Home equity loans, HELOCs, second liens, all these types of loans often require that you already own the home in order to obtain them. And if you can find a bank that'll allow you to get a second lien to make up the difference, then you run into problem number two, which is that the bank that currently holds the loan and must be the one to approve the new borrower, more often than not, will not allow for this secondary financing to be used in the assumption process. Now, you may ask, why in the world would they care? They get to keep the loan and keep getting the interest paid, right? Well, yes, that is true, but you forget Banks like money and assumable loans have limitations on what can be charged to actually go through the process of doing the loan. For example, a VA loan will not allow a borrower to be charged more than $300 to assume that loan. And although the servicing banks are following the guidelines for FHA and VA loans as it pertains to like credit and debt to income, they are permitted to place their own overlays, which are just additional conditions on these loans when they elect to do them. So they can require higher credit scores than a standard purchase or more cash reserves or lower debt to income or really whatever they want. Like for example, not allowing this loan to have a second lien, which almost all of them do not. Because if they don't have to, why would they not just originate another loan at a higher cost to the borrower? They get to get higher rates and higher margins to make more money versus an assumption that nets them next to nothing. So more often than not, the servicing banks make this process next to impossible to complete. And so when a buyer becomes frustrated with all the limitations and restrictions, they just elect to take out a new loan. And at that point, since the servicing bank that's going through this process with the buyer already has all their information, all their documents, the appraisal, and all the things that go along with doing the loan, then it's really easy just to switch them over to a new FHA, VA, or conventional loan right there with the same bank. Now, that's the issue with secondary financing. But let's assume that you have a buyer that has the cash to make it happen. They've got enough money in the bank to put down to make up the difference and take over that 3% loan. Well, problem number one with that scenario is that if the assumable loan is a VA loan, and if the borrower assuming the loan is not a veteran, then they can assume it, but the current veteran will have their entitlement held up in that loan until it's either fully paid off or refinanced, which could limit your seller's ability to obtain another VA loan when they go to purchase their next house. Now, maybe not if the purchase prices on both properties are low enough and they have enough entitlement left, but in that situation, what's the real benefit to the seller to give that loan over to the buyer? Unless in that case, they're just desperate to get the house sold. And if the buyer is a veteran, then they could have their entitlement switched. But the VA has to approve that, and it could take quite a long time for those things to get done. You and I both know how fast the government agencies move. And again, what is the true benefit to the seller if they're going to have to wait months for that loan to be approved? Plus, again, the servicing bank must approve this scenario and this buyer. And honestly, they don't have to if they don't want to. Now, with an FHA assumable loan, which by the way, is most often the loan that is assumed, the main hurdle is of course the cash, like I mentioned before, but also FHA requires that you pay mortgage insurance for the life of the loan. So you have a buyer that has $200,000 in cash to put down, but are now gonna be forced to pay mortgage insurance on an FHA loan when they could get a conventional loan with no MI. Because again, they're taking over the current terms that the seller had. Now, the difference in the payment between a 7% conventional loan without MI versus a 3% conventional loan with MI might make sense. This is why this type of assumption is most often used. But like I've said many times in this explanation, the servicing bank has to approve all of this and can take its sweet ass time in doing so and may end up saying no for whatever reason they decide. So your buyer and seller could spend months trying to make this transaction happen and still not get it closed. Then as an agent, you have a pissed off buyer or a pissed off seller who more often than not just wants to throw their hands up and move on. And it wasn't your fault, but how are they gonna feel about that entire experience? And when they decide to buy or sell their next house, are they gonna think of you when it comes time to do it? Again, it wasn't your fault, 
but people remember how they felt, not who is responsible for it. So it's not exactly the best path to go if you wanna get those eight more referrals. So just to wrap all this up, assumable loans can be a very attractive feature to put in your listing that's having a hard time getting an offer from prospective buyers these days. But all the stars have to align to make them work. And more often than not, they don't. And everyone walks away just being pissed off about the entire process. And really, the only real benefit is to the buyer. And they need the cash to pull it off. The seller's only real benefit is moving a house that otherwise is sitting on the market for too long. Because if that's not the case, why wouldn't they just take an easier to close offer from a buyer that can obtain their own separate finance? You often hear people advertise and talk about how awesome assumable loans are and how you can use them to get low rates and great terms. But once you understand the process, you know that this is a very hard thing to accomplish and an often unrealistic loan to get closed and keep everyone happy with the transaction. So assumable loans can be a great option. And they do get done, but only under very specific circumstances and only if all parties are good with moving through a process with a servicing bank that often makes it almost impossible to get closed on time or at all. So buyer and seller beware. Well, friends, that is all for today. I hope you got some helpful nuggets from today's episode that'll help you better help your clients navigate this real estate landscape that changes on us almost every day. We're all in this thing together. And if I can provide even just one little piece of your arsenal of knowledge, then I've done my job. I hope you all have a great week and look forward to seeing you back again, same time next week. But until then, be great humans and keep grinding because life is what you make it. So make it great. Adios.